It is good to be with you again tonight to study from the book of Acts. We are working our way through Acts chapter 16, and it's uh, good to be able to do this again. And I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9 and 11 for worship, and then also for Bible class in between at 10. And if you're able to do it, this would be a good time to sign up using the Sign Up Genius account. Uh, as long as we're still doing that, it really helps us to make sure that those uh, services are, are even. And that all of us have a, a chance to spread out, uh, especially especially with the virus the way it's been lately. So we're thankful for your patience. I know that it's weird, um, but we have some, some strange things going on in the world the last year and a half, don't we? And we're doing the best that we can to uh, not only uh, love each other, keep each other safe, but also do what's right in the sight of man or mankind, as we might say. We want to do what's right in the eyes of the city and uh, not give them one more reason to get on us for, for any reason like that. So uh, thank you for your uh, patience there and your participation in the Sign Up Genius thing. So many of these things, uh, we're just uh, keep on keeping on and uh, do the best that we can and I hope that all of us remain as well as possible. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts. And so it's the history of the early church written by Luke, the beloved physician. He's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he makes a point in Luke and Acts of putting things in chronological order. That is absolutely what we see going on here. And we're using the ABCs of Acts as a memory tool, and we're just going through this. We've got ascension in chapter 1 of Jesus ascending back into heaven, beginning of the church, carried and cured in chapter 3, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, Stephen the great hero in chapter 7, uh, the eunuch asking in chapter 8, how can I... In chapter 9, I am Jesus. In chapter 10, the journey to Joppa. In Acts 11, the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, Peter is liberated again. In chapter 13, we had the missionary sent out. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they were not gods but men. In chapter 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. And then last week, we moved into chapter 16. Paul and his team pick up Timothy in Lystra and Luke in Troas, and they immediately make a beeline for Philippi, where they baptize Lydia in her household, the first converts in Europe. Well, tonight we pick up with the rest of Acts 16 as they continue preaching in Philippi. So they're still there. They're still where we were last week. And by way of review in the ABCs of Acts, the summary of chapter 16 is Philippian jailer converted. So sorry to spoil the surprise. <laughs> Uh, but at least we know what to be looking for tonight. Philippian Jailer Converted. If you have a better summary of this chapter than Philippian Jailer Converted, please let me know. And I have updated these through the years uh, based on feedback from the class. But uh, man, we're not having feedback with this thing right now. And I wish we could. Uh, looking forward to uh, being back together at some point in the future. But uh, tonight, though, let's pick up with Acts 16, verses 16 through 21. So this is our... A first paragraph tonight, Acts 16, verses 16 through 21. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed, and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs, which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. In verse 16, notice Paul is heading back to the riverside, certainly uh, hoping to do some more teaching to those who are interested, those from a Jewish background. But on the way down there to the river, they run into some kind of demon-possessed young woman, a slave girl, as Luke describes her. Uh, we learn that she's making her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Uh, to me, it almost seems as if they're treating this young woman like a circus act, aren't they? So people are paying money, this slave girl says something to them, uh, the people are interested, ooh, this is, this is spooky, this is weird, let's do it again, and they would just do this over and over again. And this is how these men are making a living, totally using and abusing this young woman. Uh, by the way, money has already caused a few problems in the book of Acts, hasn't it? Uh, we think of Ananias and Sapphira selling their land, lying about the amount to make themselves look good. We've got the Simon the Sorcerer who tried to purchase the ability to give others the miraculous gifts for money. We're going to see it later. 
uh, when the silversmiths get upset that their business is getting, you know, hammered by Paul. And so here in this chapter, the situation here is these men are using this young woman to make money. Uh, but when Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke show up, this demon-possessed girl sees something in these men. And she starts announcing publicly that these men are servants of the Most High God. Uh, in a sense, some might consider this some awesome advertising. We've got the local uh, circus act, this weird young woman, the way they might see it. And she's drawing attention, you know, that Paul is the real deal. Follow this man. He's a servant of the Most High God. But uh, as we understand, not all attention is good attention. If you may remember, this happened to Jesus a time or two, didn't it? Where uh, Jesus had to rebuke a demon, uh, telling it to be quiet, even though it was speaking the truth about him. Well, he didn't really need that endorsement. It was the truth, but that's not what he needed at the time. And so Jesus had to tell it to be quiet. Well, in verse 18, this goes on for many days, this girl yelling publicly about Paul being a servant of God. And, and Paul gets annoyed. And I almost laugh when I picture Luke <laughs> writing this. Yeah, Paul was annoyed. And he can, he can see that in his mind. He writes it down. So Paul is irritated. Uh, this yelling is creating a problem. It's distracting. It's, it's hard to study the word of God with people when there's this girl screaming these things, even though the things that she's screaming are true. And so Paul turns and says to the spirit, not to the girl, but to the spirit in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it did immediately. So Paul then had the miraculous power to cast out demons, just as Jesus had promised to the other apostles earlier. Um, and then we go on. Uh, when this girl's managers or masters saw that they could no longer make money on this young woman, they dragged Paul and Silas out into the marketplace, so out in public, and they bring them to the authorities. And this case makes its way up to the chief magistrates, and the complaint is these men are throwing our city into confusion being Jews, and they're proclaiming customs that's not lawful for us to accept or observe being Roman. So they have two issues here. They're disturbing the peace, aren't they? That's one issue. And then secondly, they're teaching some really weird stuff, and it's stuff that we shouldn't be following. It's not what we believe as Romans. It doesn't match up with our culture. Uh, remember, Rome tolerated quite a bit, didn't they? Until it got distracting, until people started rioting, and so on. And so the first charge is probably the most serious. The second charge, though, is probably a reference to Paul teaching that there's only one God. And this has the potential of being pretty serious, especially if they make the connection um, between Paul saying that the emperor is not a god either, and then it kind of gets into the treason category. So uh, these are some serious charges. Uh, these are they're teaching strange things is the second one, but the first, probably the most important, is they're they're putting the city into chaos, and so it's going to get uh, get kind of weird around here. So that brings us to Acts 16. Let's continue with verses 22 through 24. Acts 16: 22 through 24. The crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. In verse 22, we find out that it's not just the girl's masters and the authorities at this point, but the people of Philippi are now upset as well. So they've been rallied together. And it's almost like what happened to Jesus. We have the betrayal in private, pretty much. Then the confrontation by the authorities. So that circle is widening. And then the crowd start joining in, crucify him. So that's the, the crowd is getting riled up at this point. Uh, once the crowds get involved, uh, the chief magistrates tear Paul and Silas's robes off and order that they be beaten with rods. Uh, personally, I'm wondering who actually beat these men with the rods. Later, we'll learn in 2 Corinthians 11.25, that this is one of three times in his life that Paul is beaten with rods. Um, we're not told who does this now, but there's a chance that it's the chief jailer who beats them at this time. And this is what jailers back then would do. They were in charge of punishment, whether it was a, a beating or imprisonment or an execution or whatever it might have been. And so perhaps it is the jailer who does this. And this becomes significant, if so, a little bit later. Uh, that Paul and Silas are beaten with rods. And uh, the Romans did the beating with rods. I think the Jewish did more of the, like the, the whip kind of thing. And they had a limit of 40, that the Romans had no limit like that. Uh, it's amazing to me at this point that as a Roman citizen, Paul does not need to endure this. 
as a Roman, he could have demanded a trial. He could have done the equivalent of flashing his his Roman citizenship badge or, you know, kind of a license kind of thing. I am a citizen. Um, however, Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't demand a trial, but he allows himself to be physically uh, and brutally beaten without a trial. This will also be rather significant in just a little bit. In verse 23, we learn that this is not an average beating, but Paul and Silas are struck with many blows. This is above and beyond. Uh, they are then thrown into the prison. The guard is told to guard them securely. And uh, when we get injured today, let's say we cut our finger with a knife or, you know, get hurt out in nature somewhere. What's the first thing we want to do? Uh, normally, we want to clean it up, get it bandaged, kind of not move it or whatever. But notice what happens here. They are beaten severely and then their movement is completely restricted in the prison. They are unable to tend to their own wounds. A Roman law said that if anybody escaped from a prison, the jailer would be held accountable. And if the charges pending on those who escaped were rather serious, the jailer would need to end up being put to death in their place. Uh, this is what happens back in Acts 12, 19, when the soldiers guarding Peter were executed when Peter escaped. Remember that? Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, Herod has Peter arrested. He's put in prison. The angel lets him out. Herod's upset. He kills the guards right there on the spot. And so it was extremely important. It was extremely motivational uh, for a jailer to keep prisoners where they needed to be. Um, so in verse 24, knowing this is serious, the jailer throws Paul and Silas not just into prison, but into the inner prison. We might describe this as a dungeon. Uh, this is the most secure part of the prison. We might refer to it today as solitary confinement or something like that. This was not just the general population. This is uh, where the worst of the worst would be restricted. Beyond this, the jailer also fastens their feet in the stocks. Stocks, of course, are usually large beams of wood with leg holes and some kind of hinge to where they could uh, have the legs put through there and then closed and locked. So it's not like chains and shackles where the prisoners could move around freely. But obviously, this is just extremely uncomfortable, especially over many hours. So it's not just keeping them secure. Uh, but this is a form of torture, so it goes beyond just keeping them in one place. They are actually torturing these men. So let's continue with what happens next. The next paragraph is Acts 16, verses 25 through 30. Acts 16, verses 25 through 30. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In verse 25, we find that around midnight, Paul and Silas are not sleeping, are they? But they are praying, and they're singing hymns of praise to God. And they are not singing quietly, are they? They aren't praying under their breath. This is not just kind of a, a whispered or a mental prayer, but this is something the others can hear. And they do hear, and they are listening to these men. The other prisoners, or residents of the prison, are listening to Paul and Silas. And this is where I'm just wondering what people can learn about the Lord based only on the songs that we sing today. I know, as we've discussed before, uh, it is entirely possible for someone to learn everything they need to know about God and God's plan to actually become a Christian based only on listening to our singing. I believe that is an accurate statement. Somebody could come in, if, if they heard the right songs at the right time, they could hear everything they need to do to obey the gospel. Uh, later, Paul will write about teaching and admonishing one another through the songs that we sing. So we teach through our singing. And this is what happens here. Paul and Silas are praying and singing. The other prisoners are listening. Do we see one possibility then as to why Paul might not have insisted on a trial? even though he was a Roman citizen, uh, his beating and arrest got him inside the prison. So I think we might say Paul has now started his own prison ministry from the inside. 
Uh, without this, imagine how hard it would have been for Paul to work through the proper channels to find a way to teach the prisoners. It probably would have been just about impossible. Uh, you know, I've been to a number of prisons here in Wisconsin, and it is almost always a hassle. Um, there is the phone call to set up the visit. Then there is the paperwork. Uh, with some facilities, there's maybe a background check of some kind. They cross-reference my credentials to make sure I am who I say I am. Uh, they search my Bible. They x-ray anything I bring with me. They put me through the metal detector. Some places I've been stamped with invisible ink uh, to make sure I don't trade places with somebody on the inside and let them out and I stay in. I will never do that, by the way. But they don't know that. So, you know, all kinds of safety mechanisms and all kinds of hassle to get into a prison to preach the Word of God. Well, Paul kind of takes a shortcut here, doesn't he? <laughs> all he has to do is get arrested. And this makes me wonder, what are they praying for here? What are they praying for at midnight? What are they singing about? What are they asking God? Are they asking for freedom? Are they asking for opportunities? Obviously, this is a public prayer in that sense. Uh, we aren't told, but as they are singing and praying, they experience a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison house are shaken. All the doors are opened. Not just one door, all the doors. And everyone's chains are unfastened. So I kind of ask myself, would an earthquake open everyone's chains? We can maybe explain the doors getting shaken open in an earthquake, but chains? This does not seem like a normal earthquake. Obviously, this is uh, very clearly miraculous. In verse 27, when the jailer wakes up and sees the prison doors open, he draws his sword. He's about to take his own life right there on the spot. Remember, Roman law called for the execution of those who allowed prisoners to escape. He assumes this has happened. How do all the prison doors pop open without everybody making a run for it? He's probably thinking, that's what I would do if I were in that situation. But Paul, out of the darkness, immediately yells, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And to me, the fact that the prisoners don't run says quite a bit about Paul and Silas. In my mind, I'm picturing Paul and Silas praying nonstop for several hours. Dear God, please get us out of here. Please get us out of here. Please get us out of here. And when the earthquake hits and all the doors pop open and everybody's chains fall off, everybody wants to see who these guys are who were praying. <laughs> at least that's the way I look at this. I'm not. It doesn't say that here. Um, but they've been listening to these men pray and sing for some time during this night. And now this earthquake happens. And instead of bolting, instead of running, like most people would have done, they stay right where they are. And I think there's a reason for that. At this point, the jailer calls for lights. Again, we may forget that we're in total darkness at this point. And the jailer rushes in, trembling with fear. He falls down before Paul and Silas. Notice how he addresses them as sirs, a term of respect. Just a few hours later, that's a uh, term of respect he would have been demanding from his prisoners. Now he is addressing these prisoners in his care, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that is an awesome question. It is the best of all possible questions. And it makes me wonder whether the jailer had perhaps himself been listening to Paul and Silas as well. How could you possibly listen to Paul for more than a few minutes without him talking about the need to be saved? And so now face to face, the jailer wants to know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, let's continue with Acts 16, 31 through 34 in response to the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. I know and you know that some have tried to isolate verse 31 from the context here to suggest that believing in Jesus is all that's necessary. And I know I've been taken to this passage many times through the years. Look, verse 31 says, believe in the Lord and you're in kind of thing. However, we need to remember that the jailer is not a Jew. He probably knows next to nothing about any of this. He's probably a pagan, idol-worshipping Roman. He wants to know what to do to be saved, and they tell him you need to believe in Jesus. 
I would point out, though, that he's not saved at this point, is he? This isn't it. He doesn't rejoice at this point in verse 31. Um, he has to believe in Jesus, but he has no idea who Jesus even is. So he's not even at the point of belief. And so at this point, Paul and Silas continue by carefully explaining what it means to believe in Jesus. He can't believe in a guy he's never heard of. In verse 34, they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his household. And as we learned from the Ethiopian eunuch a few weeks ago, preaching Jesus necessarily includes preaching baptism. And this is what we find here. In response to hearing the word of the Lord, and in response to hearing about Jesus, the jailer takes them that very hour of the night and he washes their wounds. Why would he do that? If you remember earlier in this chapter, I said that it might have been the jailer who inflicted those wounds. We aren't told that would be the case customarily. We aren't told he doesn't nail it down here. But if that is the case, do we see how this might be seen as this man's repentance? One of the steps in God's plan is to have a change of heart that results in a change of action. And so in my mind, this man who performed perhaps inflicted these wounds, he now takes it on himself to demonstrate a change of heart. He tries to fix or undo what he has done. He has this change of mind about his behavior right here, and that is certainly admirable. Uh, then Luke says that the man is baptized immediately, along with his whole household. Uh, there's no waiting except for his repentance. And I would just note here, repentance comes first. Baptism without a change of heart and mind is meaningless. And so he hears the word of God. He has a change of heart resulting in a change of action. And then he is immediately baptized. That is the biblical order of things. Here's a thought question for us to consider for a few moments. Why doesn't Paul encourage this jailer to wait so that he can walk down a church aisle on a Sunday morning? I hope we realize that coming down the aisle is very much a modern denominational invention. This was not a thing until probably the 1800s or so. The idea of giving an invitation and having somebody walk down the aisle to the mourner's bench in front of a church building and, and doing it in that way. So I think that kind of explains why he wasn't told to wait and do this in the assembly of the church later. Another thought question, why doesn't Paul encourage this man to wait until they can just get the whole church together? And why doesn't he encourage the man to wait until he can maybe come to their quarterly or annual baptism service? I know I've had updates on Facebook from local churches saying, hey, join us the first Sunday in November for our annual baptism service. And, you know, all the people who've believed in the Lord this year, we're saving it up and we're going to do it all together on this one Sunday. Why doesn't Paul encourage him to wait for something like that? The answer is baptism is necessary for salvation. And once we know this, we want to do it right away. In fact, if somebody wants to wait for some reason, I would seriously question their understanding of baptism in the first place. If you want to put it off a few weeks, I don't think you really understand the importance of what's going on here. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Waiting is not an option. Once I know what I need to do, I need to do it immediately. I would also point out in verse 34 that the rejoicing comes after the man's baptism and not before it. In other words, it's not a case of believing in Jesus, being saved, rejoicing over my salvation, and then being baptized after the fact. That's not the way it works in the Bible. Instead, this man is told to believe in Jesus. They tell him about Jesus. And in response to hearing about Jesus, he turns away from his sin. He's immediately baptized. And that baptism is followed by rejoicing. And it happens in that order for a reason. I would also point out that like Lydia, the jailer also brings Paul and Silas into his house. And he feeds them after his baptism. It is always good to feed the preacher. Uh, this is an awesome example this man sets here for us. I guess I only mention this because hospitality was a vital part of being a Christian, wasn't it? In the first century, they ate together. They got together. They spent time together. And so as God's people, we feed people. 
We feed each other. We have each other over. We spend time with each other. We fellowship with God's people. We, we spend time together. So, I mean, I can, I can drop off something at your door, kind of do a casserole drive-by. I guess that's one way of doing that. I could take you to a restaurant. You can take me to a restaurant. I can have you into my home. Um, I'm just saying, we need to be doing what the jailer's doing here, and we really need to be doing more of that. Uh, I would also just briefly note what we have noted before about the household issue. We have no indication that any babies were baptized on this occasion. In fact, the opposite of, is true. Uh, babies are not able to believe in God. Obviously, then they are excluded from this. So we've seen that with Cornelius and with Lydia. And now I just want to point out that the same thing is true of the Philippian jailer because his household is said to have been baptized here. So let's come to the uh, thrilling conclusion. This is interesting here. Acts 16, 35 through 40. It's not exactly going down the way I would expect it to go down, but uh, let's look at Acts 16, 35 through 40. Now, when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these things to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial? Men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison and now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans and they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So the next morning, the chief magistrates want this whole thing to disappear. Obviously, they've heard about the earthquake. Something huge has happened here. And so they don't even go themselves. They send the police with a message to the jailer to let these guys go. Paul, though, takes full advantage of this situation, doesn't he? And I find it interesting, first of all, that the jailer is kind of looking to Paul for advice. They've... They want you to be released. What do you think, Paul? Kind of thing. And so Paul takes advantage of it. So only now does Paul play his Roman citizenship card. Oh, by the way, you know, I forgot to mention I'm a Roman citizen, but you didn't know that, did you? So they've beaten us in public without a public trial. Now they want us to just disappear? I don't think so. Of course they want us to disappear. They want this to go away. They, they, but we're not leaving quietly. They can come and they can ask us nicely. I'm kind of paraphrasing there, but that seems to be about it. The police go back to the magistrates. They deliver that message. The magistrates are terrified. And so finally they come in person and they, they're begging Paul to leave the city. Why would Paul handle it this way? To me, it seems the reason comes down in verse 40. Instead of being run out of town immediately, it seems to me that Paul has some protection here. He is protected. They don't want to mess with him anymore. And so instead of being run out of town He's got this kind of uh, this, this protection over him. So he heads back to Lydia's house. They've got some fellowship for a little bit. They encourage the church and only then do they leave. So they're not in a big hurry to get out of there. And they, they've got this situation to thank for it. Uh, basically, Paul uses his citizenship to put the fear of God in the magistrates. And that allows the church to exist for a bit longer without any persecution. They kind of had that protection going on for them. So at the end of Acts 16, Paul and his companions leave. They head out of the city. They go on to the next city. That's going to bring us to where we pick up next week in Acts 17 with the next step on Paul's second missionary journey. So next week, then, let's pick up with Acts 17. Feel free to read ahead as Paul travels down the road to Thessalonica. And we actually have a couple books written to the church in Thessalonica after this fact. So uh, Acts 17 is critical to understanding a couple books later on in the New Testament. Uh, thank you for spending the time to study together tonight. I hope you can be with us for worship on Sunday at 9 or 11, and then for the Bible class in between at 10. Let me know if there's anything that uh, we need to be praying about that needs to be updated in the bulletin. And uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being a God who pays careful attention to what happens in prisons. We know that you see all of it, including the hundreds of men and women who are working their way through the Bible lessons offered by our congregation here in Madison. We pray that you would bless all of those who are reading your word at this very moment behind bars, that your word would take root in honest hearts and that much good can be done in your name. Thank you, Father, for Paul and Silas and for their example of wisdom and courage. Today, we're thankful for our citizenship in this great nation. 
We pray that we would always use our freedom as an opportunity to do good and to share your word freely. Thank you, Father, for saving us, and thank you for making us a part of your plan to go into all the world with the good news. In Jesus we pray. Amen.